I'm Chris Adams, Director of Training from the National Press Foundation, coming to you from the Evan Y. Davis Studios in Washington, D.C. We'll be talking today and tomorrow about rare diseases, how rare they really are, how science is changing to diagnose and treat them, how patients can advocate to get more support for them, and how regulators treat them. This program has two parts, a selected fellow class and a general audience. For those of you who were selected as fellows, congratulations. It was a very competitive program with nearly 200 applicants for 20 slots. Those fellows have received grants to write stories about rare diseases, and fellows will meet as a group later today. For those of you who aren't fellows but are joining in, welcome. Our fellows and speakers come from around the world. We've got every continent covered but Antarctica. Dark blue uh, uh, dots are speakers, light green ones are fellows. Our other guests today also come from all over the world. The top five countries joining in uh, today are from the US, Kenya, Egypt, Lesotho, and Canada. We'd also like to thank our sponsor, the Paris-based Foundation Ipsen. We'll be, we'll be moving fast over the next couple of days, as you can see from the agenda. Each speaker will present, and then we'll have time for questions. Ask your questions on the Hop and Chat platform, and I will relay them to the speakers. You can see the full agenda on our website or on the Hop and platform. After the program, we'll be posting slideshows, full interactive transcripts, session videos, and extensive resources for each of the speakers. So let's jump right in. We'll be getting an overview of the state of rare diseases from Dr. Ann Pariser, Director of the Office of Rare Disease, Disease Research at the U.S. Institute, I'm sorry, at the U.S. National Institutes of Health. It's part of the NIH's Center, National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. Dr. Pariser joined the NIH from the U.S. Food, Food and Drug Administration, where she had worked since 2000, mainly on the development of drug and biological products for rare diseases. She received her bachelor's degree from Bates College and her medical degree from Georgetown. Dr. Pariser, welcome. Um, we have a 45 minute session with her. She'll present um, for about two thirds of that and then all the time for questions. Uh, for our fellows on the, in the program, you also will have a second access to her later today for a second Q&A uh, with Dr. Pariser. So Dr. Pariser, let me turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Chris, um, and welcome everybody uh, from around the world, and um, many thanks to the organizers for inviting me. I'm just going to try for the next uh, 30 minutes or so to, to provide a general overview on rare diseases, and I know that you really have a fantastic lineup of uh, very distinguished speakers over the next two days who will go into more depth on some of these issues. So uh, just to start, Chris, as Chris mentioned, I'm coming to you from the NIH. Um, in, in the US and I will have an unavoidable US bias, although uh, many of these uh, rare disease issues are generalizable um, no matter where you're located. Um, so just a, a brief word, NIH is actually a public health agency. It's a medical research agency that commits about $42 billion a year in biomedical research, about five to six billion of which goes towards rare diseases. This is a little misleading because uh, most of that goes towards basic science, which is applicable to both rare and common diseases, but does enhance our understanding of human disease. And in cats, uh, specifically where I'm from, we focus on translational science. And what that means is trying to turn this process of observation, such as basic science, into interventions that actually improve human health. And um, within NCATS, I work in the Office of Rare Diseases Research, which is full-time devoted to rare diseases. And we try to vet benefit all rare diseases through improving the research process. Um, so why is this needed? So if you look at the left side of the screen, um, we've made just unbelievable scientific progress, especially in the last 20 years or so on rare diseases. Um, and we now have just enormous potential to try to impact human disease, but we're still in this, um, this paradigm of um, the very slow transition of the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen where we can actually benefit some of our patients. Um, it still takes about 15 years to develop a new treatment um, and billions of dollars. So how can we try to advance this promising science more quickly to, to benefit patients? And uh, these beautiful children to the right are actually some of our, our rare disease patients. 
So this is another way of putting this. This is actually um, an analysis that was done from 2007, looking at the cost of developing a single drug. It takes about 10 to 15 years and 2.6 billion US dollars to do this. And you put thousands of compounds into the early phases to get one approved drug. So this, I think um, this applies to all diseases, not just rare diseases, but the process is too slow. It's too expensive. And this one at a time approach um, just takes too long for the patients who need the science now. Um, so let's talk a little bit about rare diseases specifically. Um, first of all, you know, what is considered a rare disease? Well, this will differ a little bit depending on where you're located. Um, the first time a rare disease, also known as an orphan disease, was defined was in 1983 in the U.S. with the passage of the Orphan Drug Act. Um, and uh, a rare disease at that time was designated as a disease that affected less than 200,000 people in the U.S. So it's based on where you are. Um, the next country to follow a suit was actually Japan, which defined it a little bit differently. That was less than, I think, 50,000 patients. And Europe um, has defined uh, a rare disease as one affecting less than one in 2,000 people. So it does differ a little bit depending on where you are. But the reality is, is most rare diseases are far less prevalent than this 200,000 number um, in the U.S. Most affect just a few hundred to a few thousand, so they would be considered rare pretty much everywhere. Um, and there are about uh, 7,000 to 10,000 different rare diseases. So why the big span? Well, it sort of depends on how you define a disease and I'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, but what this translates to um, in, the, in the US and, and Europe is uh, approximately one in 10 people are affected with a rare disease. Uh, thought to be about 25 to 30 million people in the US or in the EU and about 350 million people worldwide. So that's, you know, roughly eight to 10% of the population. So that's that's a lot of people. So rare diseases are really not in fact rare uh, when considered collectively. So what are some types of diseases? Well, the vast majority of rare diseases are, are genetic diseases and they're the so-called single gene disorders or monogenic disorders. And that is there has been a, a mutation or a defect in a single gene. And most of these genes code for something that is very fundamental biology. That is a normal cellular biologic process that in some way has gone wrong. So you can think of these as housekeeping genes that keep us healthy and up and running. Um, and these are, this can affect really almost any gene that we have and hence the tens of ten, over you know, thousands of diseases. Um, so some of these uh, uh, can actually, because they are fundamental cellular processes, can actually affect multiple organ systems. Some may affect predominantly one, maybe a motor disease, a neurologic disease, or may affect multiple organs around the body. So these are often small changes, maybe even one base pair that can really have very profound and serious effects. But also included under rare are things like rare cancers. Most cancers are actually rare. Uh, blood cancers, for example, leukemia, lymphoma. All pediatric cancers, thankfully, are rare. But actually, all serious diseases of childhood are rare. Again, thankfully, most children are healthy. Some infectious diseases are included here and in the U.S., again, because it's based on prevalence in the U.S., um, Things like neglected tropical diseases, malaria, for example, you say, well, wait, that's not rare. That affects millions of people a year, and it does. But in the U.S., we only have about 1,000 malaria patients a year, so it's considered rare. And then a variety of other things, um, environmental exposures, poisoning, snake bites, um, and some polygenic or autoimmune type disorders, for example, are considered rare. So it is a huge variety of diseases affecting really across the age spectrum and every organ system. Uh, so uh, returning to these seven to 10,000 different rare diseases, we actually identify about 200 to 250 new diseases each year. So the diseases are not new, they are just newly recognized each year. So the number of diseases is growing, we'll return to that. And because these are overwhelmingly genetic disorders, by definition, you are born with these. Um, they tend to manifest in young people. 
And um, as a general rule of thumb, the more severe the mutation, the younger you are when you manifest the disease. So a lot of our patients are children, at least half or uh, young adults, although uh, there are rare diseases that manifest um, really across the lifespan. And uh, not surprisingly, because there's so many diseases and they affect small numbers of people, they're very hard to diagnose and generally under-recognized. Um, the average, often repeated average, is about five, five or more years to obtain an accurate diagnosis, but we do hear from people all the time that have actually taken decades to get a proper diagnosis. And 95% um, of our diseases have no approved therapy. Um, Part of the reason is what we talked about with the high cost um, of developing a drug uh, and how long it takes and trying to spread that over a few people. It's hard to make a business model work, but there are a, a few other reasons as well. So uh, putting what I've just said uh, graphically, um, we've made a lot of progress in the past 30 years or so. So to the left of the screen is uh, 1989 and to the right is uh, uh, 2021. And um, back about 30 years ago, we knew the molecular underpinnings, predominantly the genetic underpinnings of about 10 or so diseases. And now here we are 30 years later um, with about 7,000 of these uh, single gene disorders. And again, only about uh, 500 have a therapy or less than 5%. And um, why is this? Well, there's a number of reasons, but one a major push started in 1990 with the Human Genome Project. We were trying to sequence the entire human genome, which was completed around uh, 2001, but this work has continued. And our understanding of genes and what they do has increased, and along with that, our, our better understanding of disease. Um, and uh, just to reiterate the, the prevalence I was speaking about earlier, uh, the number of diseases is actually highly skewed towards the very low prevalence disorder. So about 10% of rare diseases affect about 90% of the patients, but conversely, about 90% of the diseases affect 10% of the patients. And this is where often the conundrum comes in. We have these very low prevalence disorders. So uh, this is a graphic from about 10 years ago from a report from the Institute of Medicine where they um, there were fewer known diseases back then. And so the numbers are different now, but the concept is the same. So towards the left of the screen are the lower prevalence diseases. These would be about the, the what would qualify the high bar there. So it would qualify as a rare disease in the US um, with um, uh, having the majority of the diseases. But when you look at that, the rare diseases and blow them up, you see the same pattern. Most of the diseases cluster here to the left um, with this very low prevalence affecting less than about 3,500 patients. And in some cases, far fewer than that. We do have diseases that we know, that what we know now can affect 10 or fewer patients in some cases. So um, in addition to these business model challenges that I presented and efficiency challenges, that also presents a lot of research challenges. And I know that Lucia Monaco will be discussing this a little bit more later, but just very briefly, because there are small numbers of patients and because there are so many diseases, many of them are poorly understood, um, which makes developing a therapy hard and running a clinical trial hard. Um, even within the small number of patients with the disease, there's a lot of variability. And again, this is because they tend to be genetic. So depending on where in the gene the defect is, you can have considerable variability in how they present. Um, our patients tend to be spread out across the globe, um, but they also can cluster geographically as well as being very spread out. So for example, um, some diseases tend to cluster in communities that um, often that may be isolated for some reason, perhaps geographically, perhaps for some uh, social reasons. Um, there are also very few disease experts with the disease and they too tend to be um, geographically dispersed and patients will awful ha often have to travel great distances to get care or participate in clinical trial. Um, as I touched on earlier, these affect fundamental processes. Most are serious or life-threatening. And um, because we have very few approved drugs, there's very little clinical trial precedent. And as I mentioned before, many affect children, which also presents some ethical issues when you're doing research. Um, so because of all this, it does present some challenges, but we also, um, rare diseases require a very high degree of collaboration 
often international, uh, data sharing and patient involvement. Patients and parents are often uh, leaders in uh, developing therapies for these diseases. So that's the bad news, but let's look at the, the good news is uh, rare diseases are really a model for precision medicine. So precision medicine comes by many names, precision, targeted, even personalized medicine, where we're trying to target smaller and smaller populations, but in a much more precise way, again, based on what is that underlying underpinning that we're getting better understandings with. So um, here's some slides of some approvals in the, the US um, for gene therapies. Uh, these first two were uh, for cancer therapies um, approved in 2017 um, for the so-called CAR T therapies, which can be highly effective when they work. And then uh, later in two th uh, 2017 and then 2019, we had the first two non-cancer genetic disease uh, gene therapies open. So this is really um, paradigm shifting advanced therapeutics um, that when they, they work, they can really work extremely well. We'll return to that, um, but can also open the door for more common conditions as well. And from what we hear from our FDA colleagues, they now have hundreds of uh, gene therapies in development. So that's really very exciting news. Um, an example of rare diseases leading the way. And um, there's also a lot of activity in the rare disease space. So um, FDA has about um, half of their approvals for the novel uh, drugs every year are in rare diseases. And, um, but on a good year, we're getting you know 20 to 30 drugs. And as I mentioned before, um, we identify about 200 or so new diseases each year. So um, we definitely have our work cut out for us. All right, so what are some strategies and that we can employ and what are some things we're doing now to try to bring these exciting advances in science forward now that are gonna benefit many more diseases and many more patients quicker. So um, I put down a few strategies here that we're actually currently working on now. And what's very exciting, I think, um, and maybe of interest to all of you, is these are also, you know, really great medical and research stories. And you'll probably be hearing a lot more about this, I, I hope, in, in coming um, months and years. So I put down three strategies here we're working on, but certainly there are more. And uh, the first one we'll talk about here is many diseases at a time. Uh, so instead of this traditional paradigm of walking through diseases, um, one disease at a time, which takes a long time and costs a lot of money, are there strategies that we can employ that are going to do this faster? So I'm just going to return here to the promise of gene therapy. So I showed you um, one of the uh, gene therapies was approved in 2019 for um, a muscular disease called, or a neuromuscular disease called spinal muscular atrophy or SMA, which is a form of muscular dystrophy. Um, so uh, this little girl here is Evelyn. She's three and she has spinal muscular atrophy type one or SMA1, which is the infantile form. So the natural history of SMA1 is that almost all of these children succumb to their disease before the age of one, and they never gain motor milestones. Uh, they never sit up, certainly never walk. And here's Evelyn who received um, gene therapy uh, when she was a few months old and is doing really well. So the uh, first, uh, phase trial um, included about 15 patients. Not everyone walked, but um, they all gained milestones, which is really a singular and exciting result. And so what is the problem? Well, um, this also turned out to be the most expensive uh, therapy ever, um, a price of $2.1 million. And it's created a lot of problems despite this efficacy um, of patients getting access to it. Um, Looking at a different advanced therapy, not gene therapy, a precision medicine approach using what's called antisense oligonucleotides or ASO. These are tiny pieces of RNA that are targeted to an individual or personalized um, mutation a patient might have. And here is one example from a few years ago. Um, this is a little girl named Mila. She had a rare form of Batten disease. Batten disease is rare. There are several types of Batten disease and she had one of the rarer forms of Batten disease. So now we're talking really tiny populations. And this is her mom, Julie, and a researcher named Dr. Tim Yu, who's at Boston Children's Hospital. Um, so what they did is they managed to make a tailor-made antisense oligonucleotides. These can be very flexible therapies. You create these small, little um, pieces of RNA 
And in this case, it was targeted to Mila. So the Mila, the medicine was called Milicin. And um, what was remarkable about this is they managed to go from understanding Mila's mutation to getting a drug administered within two years. So that also is, is remarkable, I think, in showing us what can be done. But this, again, it was at a cost of about $2 million. So that raises a question of, you know, how do we do more of this? How do we do it faster? And how do we do it for more people to make this scalable to our 7,000 or so diseases and our, our 350 million patients? So um, one thing we are exploring are, are platforms and master protocols. So this is something that has been used in cancer world, and we're trying to adopt these. So what is a platform? A platform is a durable infrastructure. It means you build the research infrastructure instead of building it up and tearing it down to test one drug, which tends to happen now, is you build that infrastructure, and then you can, it can support the testing of multiple therapies and sometimes multiple diseases. So this is being used used in, for example, lung cancer and breast cancer. I put two examples here. Um, and um, this way you can rule lots of patients and test lots of drugs in a very efficient way. And if they don't seem to be working, you drop them and you move on to something else. Uh, so we ask, we, we and others have asked the question, is this something we can do for rare diseases? So um, at NIH, we're starting a very small pilot called Platform Vector Gene Therapy, or PAVE-GT, where we're trying to pave the way for more rare disease uh, gene therapies. And in this pilot, what we're trying to do is to develop four gene therapies at the same time. Um, so again, the platform says durable infrastructure, and the vector in this case is a virus, um, which is the most common way or the only way right now to do gene therapies. And I'll say just a little bit more about that. So um, viruses are very simple organisms. They tend to have an outer shell or protein shell called a capsid and then the viral DNA or RNA inside. So the most commonly used way, and we use these virus particles actually to try to deliver a gene. And the most common way to do that is with something called the adeno-associated virus, although there are other viruses or an AAV. So in this greatly oversimplified cartoon, is um, what you can do is you pull out the virus's DNA, you keep the empty shell, and then in theory, you could insert any gene that you want to deliver to a patient. So I could do a red one, a purple one, a blue one, yellow one. Um, and this is, um, again, grossly oversimplified, but it's using the postal service model. Um, if it fits, it ships. So if the cargo fits in the box and it's properly labeled, in theory, we could deliver this cargo, the gene, to anywhere we want. Um, in, in our case, what we're looking at are muscle or liver diseases. So this is a natural platform. The potential here, we could, in theory, treat thousands of diseases. So um, this is, um, again, a schematic on the top of a traditional way to do things is we do each program one at a time and we march through all the steps and um, with each step uh, costing more money as we move towards clinical trials. So what we're trying to do with this program is can we learn from one program to another? Can we maybe not have to repeat these steps? Can we apply some of this knowledge learned from one to another because we would be using that same virus, same manufacturing process, same delivery methods. So there should be some things, at least again in theory, that should be the same. So can we go faster? Can we be more efficient? And then can we include the patients on what's called a master protocol, in this case, an umbrella trial? So um, I mentioned we're doing muscle and liver diseases. So let's just focus on the liver diseases, the organic acidemias. We had two diseases, um, two different genotypes represented by the colors. Um, you do the genomic analysis of the patients and treat each with um, the different gene, depending on the underlying defect, but you could consider them in the same protocol, same outcome, same measure, same investigator, same site. So again, if you had multiple diseases that looked like this, but were caused by different genes, could you line up 
more diseases and, and treat them within the protocol. And we don't know yet, but we hope the answer to that is yes. So that's one strategy. And we actually have written a paper and published this, and I put the link here if you'd like to check um, it, learn more about this. Um, but also because we're a public health agency, our plan is to throw all of this into the public domain and hope other people can benefit from it. Another strategy that's being used are um, clinical research networks. So in our case, we have something called the Rare Diseases Clinical Research Network, or the RDCRN, um, where we're grouping three or more diseases within a consortium in a network and then try to get people to work together. So this is a program um, at NIH that's been supported for about 20 years. And um, this is, a, again, a cartoon of what it looks like. It's a little hard to read, but um, there are 20 different consortia. And through this method, we are able to cover about 250 diseases at the same time. So um, Europe has something similar. There are multiple networks all over the place. And Europe has actually gone bigger in a um, Daria um, Jill Kowska will be talking about that a little bit later, but this is another um, well-traveled and common way of uh, studying rare diseases that has that efficiency effect. So um, another strategy I'll just briefly mention is, um, okay, we have so many diseases, can we make fewer diseases? So I suppose your your question would be, well, how do you, how do you do that? You know, you've got thousands of the diseases, how do you, how do you make that smaller? Well, um, partly is the way that you define a disease. Uh, traditionally, that's been based on clinical manifestations or what's known as a phenotype, is how patients present. They have symptoms, they have clinical characteristics, and then we try to dig deeper and understand what the molecular underpinnings are. But what if we thought about th this differently? So as I've told you, most of these are rare diseases, overwhelmingly. Um, but um, are rare genetic diseases, but uh, the, the genes only go wrong in so many ways. So um, I, I've listed a few here, but I'll just highlight one of them. So something, uh, one um, kind of mutation is to produce something called a premature stop codon. A codon is a grouping of three base pairs that basically tells the cellular machinery to stop reading the DNA, to stop. And if it appears, too early through a mutation, you can truncate um, the downstream protein, for example, to be very short, non-functional, or even non-existent. So these tend to be very severe mutations. Well, you can have a premature stop in any genetic disease. So instead of defining this based on the symptoms, can we define it based on the G disease? So now going from thousands of diseases, we can go to dozens of diseases perhaps. So can, can we then group this for more efficiency? So the answer we think is yes, and this is just a cartoon, I'll just illustrate this again. So I have four diseases here and let's just say they are completely unrelated. One affects um, the liver, the heart, the muscle or the nervous system. But using the REDS as that stop conon disease, which I just mentioned, I would genotype patients across these diseases that don't appear related at all. And I would find the patients with the stop codons. And then I would group them all in one protocol. And this is a different type of master protocol. It's called a basket trial. And then in theory, I could treat all these different patients with different diseases with the same drug. So th that would be a very efficient way of going about things. So um, sounds far-fetched, but it actually isn't. And uh, again, borrowing from, from cancer world has actually been done. Um, and this, these were, this was a trial of patients with a rare fusion mutation that were treated with the same drug. And I think if you look at the numbers here, you have patients with certain tumors with just one patient all the way up to 12. So they were all grouped in the same basket. And this drug um, worked across the board and it actually um, ended up being approved. So this is a strategy we would really like to explore. And we've actually started um, funding uh, some investigators um, to do this. So lastly, I'd just like to mention another strategy would be to, um, if you have very few patients with the disease, how can we find more patients? Um, well, as um, I, I already mentioned, is um, it's hard to diagnose people. It takes a really long time. And we also know there are people out there right now who haven't been diagnosed. And this happens so often in rare diseases, we call it the diagnostic odyssey for which there are many contributing factors, some of which I've already um, listed. But what we also know 
is being undiagnosed just carries a substantial monetary and also human cost. People are treated for the wrong disease. They don't receive therapies that may be available, or they don't have specific ways that we can intervene to um, lessen suffering and, and disease burden. So we and others have been trying to quantify this burden. Um, for example, the Every Life Foundation uh, recently tried to quantify this in the U.S. based on uh, almost 400 diseases, and it turned out the cost in 2019 was somewhere around a trillion dollars. There was another study that they, I think they um, titled accurately, Can You Hear Us Now?, um, which came up with very similar numbers. And we at NIH, again, we looked at a smaller cohort of diseases and found very high costs on average, and also um, a fairly high burden to being undiagnosed. And also underway right now is the U.S. General Accountability Office, which is kind of the government's accountants, has a, a similar study that's underway. So um, stay tuned for more information there. But what does this mean uh, for research and patients? Well, um, it means we can probably find these patients based on some characteristics and we can probably intervene earlier. So this is actually was done on an experimental way by uh, Stephen Kingsmore um, at Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego for something he called Project baby bear. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, that um, the more severe a mutation, usually the younger you are. So if you look at the youngest group of patients, and those would be very sick newborns in the neonatal intensive care unit, um, it stands to reason that some of them are going to have a genetic disease. So that was the theory they went forward to and what forward with. And what they did is they performed a genomic analysis on all NICU patients um, in their ICU, first on a small scale, and then they spread it across the NICUs in California. And they have a diagnostic yield of about 30%. So that's about one in three very sick newborns has an underlying genetic disorder. So that's a lot. Now, obviously, if you went to the general population, it wouldn't be nearly that high. But they also managed to show um, that in addition to being intervened and prevent catastrophic consequences in some patients, they also saved a lot of money. So this is now being spread to other areas. So uh, Florida, the state animal of California is a bear. State animal of Florida, I think, is a manatee. So they called it Project Manatee. And now also in uh, Michi uh, Michigan, Project Baby Deer. But this is something that's starting to be spread. But so what we're trying to do is we're trying to learn from this experience and the burden experience and identify what we're calling zebra triggers. Um, so I've showed you have several zebras in my slides and uh, people asking what's with, what's with all the, the zebras? Um, well, this comes from an old medical school adage. Um, what you tell medical students is when you hear hoofbeats, think of horses, not zebras. Zebras are not common in the United States, so common things occur commonly. Uh, don't give somebody a rare diagnosis if they probably have a common problem, but we want people to think of zebras, and we want to think of zebras when you start seeing certain clusters of things. Young age, high utilization, um, multiple consults, having to travel distant, dif great distances, but also some of these what we call basket codes, like um, developmental delay or motor delay. And what we're trying to do now is develop strategies around this uh, to try to bring these people to attention sooner. So I'll just um, sum up them with a few take home points. Um, so rare diseases, we have many, many diseases that affect small numbers of patients each and very few treatments. But when you consider this collectively, it really is a large public health problem. We're also uh, we're in a time of just unprecedented scientific um, opportunity, and what we're really facing now are more operational logistical barriers and less so scientific, although certainly there are scientific challenges to be overcome. And I think um, what I'm also showing is that rare diseases often lead the way. Things like gene therapy are being looked at for things like Parkinson's disease, which is very common, and some other common diseases. And this is typical of rare diseases. Actually, the first chemotherapies were for rare cancers. Um, the cholesterol medicines used by billions of people around the world were actually developed in a one in a million high cholesterol disease. And um, we really do need to get away from this one disease at a time strategy for any disease. We have to think differently. We have to adapt and adopt new strategies. And some of these many disease at time models and tr non-traditional approaches is what we really need to work towards. And I know you're gonna be hearing more about this in the next two days. 
So I'm just, I put down a few resources for you, but I just wanted to mention, we are always here for you. If you ever have questions, you need more background, you wanna know about more disease, please just, you know, get in touch with us. We're always happy to help. So I will, um, I will stop there and I'd be very happy to take questions. Okay, well, thank you very much for that fascinating overview. It's gonna be a, it's a good roadmap for what's gonna be coming for our fellows and viewers over the next couple of days. My first question, is actually a little bit a little bit bizarre i saw the uh those pictures of the zebra my first thought was uh, is that the, are those are the zebras that are wandering around prince george's county <laughs> no for no, those but... of you for those of you not in the washington dc area which i know is most of you a couple three zebras from a private farm escaped in suburban washington and they're kind of wandering around they've been looking for them for the last couple of days so i more seriously um uh, for the fellows and the viewers out there, please put your questions into the event Q and A, and we will, and I'll be able to access the questions there, and I'll relay them to Dr. Pariser. Um, I have some questions, but this time is mostly set aside for you. So if you have questions, please get them into the Q and A. We will we'll take a handful of questions between um, 10:45 Eastern Time, U.S., and uh, then we have Dr. Pariser for a separate Q and A for fellows later on today. So um, first question I have is just dealing with the prevalence data on rare diseases. Um, you said that they affect about 8% of the population, although different countries kind of account for them uh, or, or their definitions are different, but are there regional variations in that? I mean, are, are, are the, the kinds of rare diseases, are they kind of, the different types of rare diseases, are they spread evenly around the globe or are there certain rare diseases that are, that are far more prevalent in Europe and others that are far more prevalent in Southeast Asia or things like that? Yes, it's, it's the latter. Um, so again, because they're genetic, they will tend to cluster in certain populations and this can be for a variety of reasons. So for example, um, in the United States, um, the Amish population, um, which is um, a, a, a religious group, um, they are, uh, as well documented, they have a number of genetic diseases, and this is because um, most people who came to the United States descended from about 300 um, um, ancestors. So there were concentrations of certain genes in the population. So there are some diseases you will see only in certain populations or disproportionately in certain populations. So. Um, although rare diseases um, occur generally at about the same rate around the globe, the types of rare diseases can be very different depending on where you are. Okay. And when we're talking about rare diseases and the incidence rates for them, are those rare diseases that have been diagnosed or is that just an estimate of how many we think are out there? Because I understand that so many rare diseases aren't diagnosed or if they get diagnosed, they, it takes years for them to get diagnosed. So um, it's a it's a guesstimate, and it's based on both of those. Some of those are for some diseases, for example, where there's newborn screening, where we may be able to to diagnose pretty much everybody who has that disease. We may have precise estimates. Others are based on um, mutation rates within the genes, where you can get an estimate about how many people may have it in a certain region. But we don't have um, precise estimates for the vast majority of our diseases. Okay. So I have a question here from David Wahlberg, who is one of our fellows from the Wisconsin State Journal in the United States. Uh, what does the Orphan Drug Act do? Has it been updated and, it, and does it need to be updated? So the Orphan Drug Act was passed in the U.S. in 1983, and there are other similar Orphan Drug Acts in various uh, parts of the world which have some differences. But the thinking back in 1983 is the big barrier uh, to developing a drug for a rare disease was the cost. So most of the Orphan Drug Act focuses on providing financial incentives. Um, for example, uh, if your drug gets approved, you get seven years of market exclusivity where no one can compete with you. Um, there are also tax credits and there's a waiver of the PDUFA fee, which is a fee you have to pay to the US, uh, um, US FDA to get your drug reviews, which is about $2 million. So it predominantly focuses on the financial side. But we know that in addition to the financial side of some of the things that I showed you, there are also research questions. So there has been lots of additional legislation 
since then in the U.S. as well as other parts of the world. So there was a Rare Disease Act in 2002, which actually established the Office of Rare Diseases Research at NIH, um, networks um, and funding for rare diseases research. There have been other things um, like the pediatric uh, priority review uh, rare disease vouchers and neglected tropical disease vouchers to try to find more incentives. And then um, what's known as regulatory flexibility for serious and life-threatening diseases not specific to rare diseases, but disproportionately applies to rare diseases. So it's kind of a patchwork of all kinds of both incentives, as well as regulatory flexibility, as well as research funding. Okay, and uh, we will have a presentation later today from Aaron Friedman, who is from the U.S. Uh, Food and Drug Administration, talking talking at more length about the Orphan Drug Act. Um, a question here from Aaron. Uh, Prater, who is one of our fellows from the Colorado Springs Gazette in the U.S., if two individuals with similarly located errors on the same gene with the same or similar phenotype each had a different type of error, would it potentially uh, would it be potentially effective to treat them differently? It could be, and and those strategies are being used. Um, if you uh, there are drugs that can be targeted just to one particular type of a mutation. But there are also strategies such as a gene replacement therapy where you're trying to just replace the whole gene that would work across any mutation. So both of these are used and there are actually approved drugs and drugs in development um, that target, target both of those strategies. Okay, now how does the NIH decide of, of so many rare diseases out there and so many potential strategies to diagnose or treat them, how does the NIH decide which ones to fund? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a difficult question. Um, so there's a variety of things that work there, too. Um, some of these are under congressional mandate. So, um, for example, there was a cancer moonshot a few years ago that provided a large amount of funding for certain types of very rare cancers. So that came out of, um, you know, a congressional mandate or um, some diseases like uh, muscular dystrophies have um, their own funding and, and legislation. Um, others are under kind of more umbrella funding announcements where we, we will solicit out to the community saying, so for example, our Rare Disease Clinical Research Network propose a consortium of three or more diseases, and then it goes to peer review. The, uh, the investigator would propose what diseases, how they're going to study them, their research plan. It goes to peer review and it will get scored. And then the, usually the, the better scoring applications will then get funded. So it can be very specific, very targeted, or they can be very broad calls and there's just everything in between. Okay, well, we have time for just one more question. It's 1044 here in Washington. Um, uh, just in, in the next 60 seconds, is there a, you got a room full of journalists in front of you who are looking for story ideas on rare diseases what's you know what's the one thing that you would like to see a smart journalist cover do a story on um talk to the patients and the parents um the parents are um funding um research uh building registries natural history studies working with researchers um running bake sales and uh, pushing these things forward um we have many many patient groups that work with us and they um some of the things that people are doing are absolutely incredible um, these are people often who are not they're not scientists they're not medical people and um, their child, uh, usually, this is a typical situation, their child has just been diagnosed with something they've never heard of. And they start looking around and there's no research going around, so they do it themselves. And people have done just some utterly amazing things. Uh, really, uh, there are many great stories out there, so um, I'd ur urge you to, to look there. Okay, um, let me tell you what, uh, we. We have a 15 minute break set for right now, but I have just have a, had a couple more questions come in from the fellows. I'd like to get as many in as we can. So let's just take two more quick questions and then we'll have a 12 minute break instead of a 15 minute break. Um, so a question from Limpo Sella, who is from the Lesotho Times and Sunday Express. Um, some rare diseases are geographical and it could be due, <clears throat> Some rare diseases are geographic and could be due to social reasons. Uh, I mean, what could be some of those reasons? Are there social reasons that are causing them? Um, well, 
I, I think um, one of the ones I mentioned, the Amish population, which are relatively isolated for cultural reasons. So um, when you have that, um, then then you will see concentrations of certain disease, diseases and um, within certain populations or um, people that are isolated, perhaps geographically. Um, they're in uh, rural or remote areas. And um, for the same reason, you'll have smaller populations and you may see certain genetic concentrations there. So that, that can come from social um, reasons as well. Okay. And this will be the final question. This is from our fellow Bob Rohr. Uh, much of the effort involves gene therapy, which is high tech and expensive. Could you talk about perhaps more affordable strategies? Sure. So drug development goes on as well. Um, so the better we understand the gene and what it does and what it, precisely that mutation is, the better we can develop a specific therapy, be it a drug or gene or these anti-sense oligos that I was talking about. But um, through these platforms and collective strategies that we're talking about, our, our main hope here is that these, uh, the cost of these is going to go way down. As we do more of them, we learn things, make it more efficient, not have to repeat everything. We're really trying to, to bring uh, the cost down there. But, but, but um, lower cost strategies go on as well. So specifically that um, stop codon um, example that I gave you, those are actually drugs that are under development. They're called read through. So instead of seeing that stop, you read through. So those are actually some drugs that are being explored there, um, not just gene therapies or ASOs.